Now, the assembly of the International Space Station is a task that has relied very heavily on the use of robotics, uh, most notably the station's remote manipulator system, or CANADARM-2. Uh, that was used to put entire modules into place, as well as to move astronauts and other equipment from place to place. But the fact that the assembly is almost over doesn't mean that the use for robotics is over. Uh, in fact, last week, robots were front and center on a task, a cargo transfer job, that uh, didn't require astronauts to suit up and go outside. We're going to take a few minutes today to talk about that recent work and the use of robotics on board the station. With me is uh, Ian Mills, who is one of the robotics officers here in Mission Control. Um, the task last week that I was mentioning uh, was moving things called CTCs. Let me get you to start by telling us what a CTC is and why these needed to be moved. Sure, okay, the CTCs are a cargo transport uh, container, uh, effectively just a big metal box with a hinge lid. Um, they contain uh, orbital replacement units, ORUs, uh, things that we can replace on orbit, uh, robotically uh, or EVA crew. But and these uh, are spare parts that are just stored out there. That's correct. Uh, these particular uh, CTCs contained uh, the remote power uh, controllers that we use there to switch boxes that we uh, power on and off different loads. Um, why we were moving these particular boxes, um, uh, we currently, or we had, sorry, at the beginning of last week, we had a one of these CTCs um, stored uh, on board um, Dexter, as he is uh, commonly referred mm -hmm. to. Um, we referred to him as the special purpose Dexter manipulator. Obviously, you can see where he gets his name. Um, we had a CTC already uh, on board the SPDM, and that was uh, to support uh, replacing a failed uh, RPCM. Um, however, that did not happen. Uh, there were certain thermal issues that were uh, brought forward before those operations were able to take place. So we've just been holding this CTC uh, on effectively on our back uh, uh, as we have gone along with other operations. Um, time has come now to prepare for the next um, H2 transfer vehicle coming, HTV4, and uh, the expectation is that we will not have uh, any any cargo uh, on board the SPDM because it will be used as part of those operations. Um, so the main goal for, for the task last week was to relocate the CTC that we had, we'll call that one CTC3, um, and put it in its uh, expected location for the uh, HTV4 mission. Um, the and then in, the, in the process, freeing up the a spot on the SPDM for other uses. That's correct. For the transfers, the the cargo transfer that's coming up on HTV4 will utilize the uh, the SPDM storage uh, location. Um, so we needed to clear that. Um, combined with that, the program had decided that it made more sense um, to put uh, the CTC uh, that was outboard, we'll call that one CTC5, put it in the place, um, put move it closer to uh, the crew airlock and. Um, since there are uh, orbital replacement units, the spares inside these boxes, um, putting that particular CTC closer to the U.S. airlock makes it more accessible to EVA crew if they have to go out and perform um, some kind of repair. Um, so that was the main goal for now, the uh, operations last week. I mentioned Canon Arm 2. People are very familiar with that. It's very dramatic when you see it. You don't see the SPDM that much. Tell us what it does that the arm can't? What, what's, what makes it special? Okay, well, um, you may not see it very often, well. but uh, yeah, it's, it's come to the forefront as far as uh, robotic operations. What it does, allows us to do that's different than we do with the, uh, the Canada arm, is um, it is a smaller um, robot uh, that allows us to have finer control um, for doing the detailed task work um, that we need to do to, to affect repairs on the station. Its main purpose is to allow us to uh, repair uh, certain units that are robotically compatible without having to send EVA crew out, uh, which frees up the, the crew members to continue with uh, science on board. Um, so that's the primary difference between um, the SPDM and the uh, Canada arm. If, 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 the, if the RMS is an arm, is, is the SPDM a hand? Um, it's more, I would think of it more like a, it's an extension of, uh, yes, it, that, that's, that's reasonable. So, yeah, we use SPD, or the uh, SSRMS, which is a 56-foot long manipulator, and it is, it was designed and built for space station assembly. Um, it, uh, 
was designed also to be able to pick up the SPDM to do the fine work. So yeah, that's a fair analogy to call the SRMS big, and the uh, the smaller one. The smaller one would be the hand for the dexterous work. And in this particular case, all of these operations that went on didn't involve the crew at all. And by that, I don't mean just the crew didn't have to go outside to do work. They weren't involved in controlling the arm either. It was controlled from the ground, right? That is correct. Since um, I want to say 2005, when we first started executing. Um, maneuvers of the uh, of the Canadarm2, we call it SSRMS, mm -hmm. it's an acronym name, we have to use those since we're NASA. Yeah. Since we started uh, ground control of SSRMS in 2005, we have um, progressively uh, increased our capability. We started out with very small scripted maneuvers um, and now we're to the point where, yes, we are engaged from the ground, uh, solely from the ground with um, fine ORE replacement uh, tasks that uh, can also be executed by the crew via EVA, but it does make a lot of sense for us to be able to do it from the ground. When we say that you can move it from the ground, we don't mean just over here in this room, right? There are more than one place from which you can run the arm. There are. We have. Um, we we do have a console here in a uh, mission control um, where we where we sit. We also have a uh, a control center uh, in Canada at uh, Montreal the uh, Canadian Space Agency, where we do have uh, operators that are trained and certified as well that uh, that do um, do the flight and same flight control job. We don't have them, we don't have the primary uh, position uh, there yet, but I know that that is in work, so primarily it's run out of here and then the backroom support, if you want to call it that, is uh, frequently manned by uh, our trained personnel in uh, at CSA. What is it like to sit here in this room and command a 50-foot-long robot that's in orbit. It, is that fun? It, it is fun. Um, for me, it's exciting to sit here and be able to, to send the commands, yes, and have the, the, the arm move, go where you tell it to go, or, or complete a, an install of, uh, of the CTC, as we were uh, talking about. Uh, for me, it's very exciting. There's a high degree of um, complexity to it. I know it's probably not very fun to watch because the rates that we the, uh, uh, operate with are very slow. So um, to make it interesting, we have to do a time lapse uh, mm -hmm. playback um, so that you can actually perceive some of the motions because that is one of the, um, the constraints that we operate with is to maintain safety is that we operate this in a very controlled, uh, slow, deliberate manner, especially when we're uh, in contact or engaging a, a mechanism. Uh, your CTC operations last week proved that uh, there is always something that can go wrong. Uh, explain what it was that happened. There, there were operations on two days, Thursday and Friday last week, and Thursday you were starting to move one of these the CTCs, and what did, what did you encounter? Well, um, let me start by just saying that uh, I have been here at NASA for 17 years. I've been in the robotics operations group that entire time. And um, one thing for sure that I have learned is that uh, nothing ever ha goes exactly as you planned. And the issues that you encounter um, are not necessarily what you are prepared for. Mm -hmm. So when we, what happened to us uh, last week was the, uh, the operation involved first picking up CTC-5 and bringing it around to the, the uh, stowage platform close to the airlock. When we got over there and began to put it down, it got stuck. It would not go all the way down. And um, we, uh, after a quick video survey, realized that there are some um, straps, some thermal uh, straps coming off of the adjacent box to where we were putting this down that uh, we did not account for in our models. Um, combined with the uh, CTC itself, um, actually has a handrail. We also did not have that handrail in our model, so it was the interference between these straps and this handrail that uh, caused us to not be able to put the, the CTC down. Wouldn't fit in the spot. In that spot. Mm -hmm. You got to stop and think about what you're going to do next. Uh, how do you resolve that situation? What was what was the what was the answer here? Um, the answer ended up being um, uh, the box, since it contains spares. Um, they require thermal conditioning to uh, to maintain their survivability, their usability. And so a 10-hour thermal clock was started when we pulled the box off of its uh, original location. And so we were working against that clock. And so it may have been possible for us to figure out how to um, work around these straps, wiggle our way down at this location. However, um, it, to me, I, I didn't feel like we had enough time. So what we ended up doing was standing down for an hour and a half or so, put together a plan to just backtrack 
the same trajectory that we came from. Return it. And return it back to its original location. And yet you were ultimately <coughs> able to achieve the other goal, and that was to free up that uh, spot on the SPDM. That's correct. Since both of these um, these boxes that we're moving around were CTCs, and they are mounted on a uh, common attachment system that we call the FRAM, that's a flight releasable attachment mechanism, either can go in, in either spot. And uh, we did stand down uh, and evaluate um, the situation since we ran into um, our models being incorrect. We first needed to validate uh, the CTC uh, config, so we took some uh, some video on board just to verify what its config was. It did not have the handrails we expected, so there would not be the interference between the straps and that that handrail. So we decided to just go ahead and put the CTC down where we were planning to put the CTC-5. And I know that's a bunch of numbers and it gets all jumbled, but eventually we ended up in the, in the same config. We had these two boxes in their same locations. They were just reversed from what we had intended. And you found the, the solution and, and got into the the configuration that you were after, uh, a little ingenious thinking that actually won you a, a, a lot of praise at the mission management team meeting yesterday for, for creative thinking. Yes, I won't necessarily take that all for myself. It is a team effort. We have uh, three people that uh, man the console for the robotics um, operations, and so uh, as well as we had uh, other people back in the office uh, uh, scrambling to help us put this plan together. So it truly was a, a team effort. It's interesting to to hear how it goes because it, it, it reminds us that working in space is not as easy as it sometimes looks. Uh, you've got to do what to, to take care of things as they as they crop up. Absolutely, and that is one of the other things that I have learned in my 17 years is that it is important to prepare for the, the unknown. Um, I have rarely, if ever, encountered the issues that we plan for. However, going through that process of being prepared to deal with things in real time um, just makes you that much more prepared to handle whichever uh, scenario you may be working That does come up. Ian, thanks very much and enjoyed hearing about this. Ian Mills is one of our robotics officers here in the Mission Control in Houston.